Thank you. Ooh, maybe I need to raise this. Huh? Ooh, I've never done this before, I don't think. I feel like a rock star. <laughs> well, hello, everyone, and uh, I want to thank everyone uh, for the invite, and it's an honor to be here. Uh, special thank you from me to Jean-Philippe, uh, Marilyn, and uh, the whole Geomont gang for making this so easy for me to come here. Uh, very beautiful venue, uh, easy flight from Halifax to uh, Trudeau, Montreal Trudeau Airport, and then a free shuttle uh, bus. I don't know why I'm telling you all this. <laughs> because I didn't know it existed. Uh, free shuttle to Via Rail train, and then a nice train to, uh, to here. So uh, I'm, I'm very uh, happy to be here. So today... Um, uh, I want to talk about uh, the two key words, free and open. And uh, there's many, many words we can use, and you hear these words often. And uh, I'd like to take this time to give some history. Um, when uh, it's been around for so long, uh, people sometimes forget the history. And so it's important to have people like me in the... Uh, maybe some of the gray hairs to, to talk about where it started, how it started, uh, who had the idea, who, uh, and, uh, and who's involved, and where are we now? So I will take this time near the end to maybe give some thoughts about the, uh, the status of open source, um, some key points that I think are happening, and uh, what, I'd like to, what, what I think uh, we, we need to work together on. So let's begin. So uh, a quickly uh, background of me. So uh, all of these uh, little logos are a little part of me and uh, my history. So uh, I used to be quite embarrassed of this uh, because when you're growing up and you come out of high school and you're maybe good at maths and sciences and your guidance counselor puts you in engineering and you don't know where you are at 17, 18 years old, uh, uh, now I would love engineering, but 17, 18, maybe, maybe not. First time away from school. So every little part of this in the far left, I was in nursing, registered nursing. Uh, I worked uh, at the Honda plant in Allison, Ontario, making Civics, <laughs> believe it or not, Honda Civics. Uh, uh, in the middle is a missing tooth because I was a professional ice hockey player. My, all my fam brothers... Uh, uh, um, my middle brother played in the NHL for eight years uh, as an enforcer. So, um, and yeah, so uh, he's six foot eight. So uh, be nice to me. I have I have big brothers. Uh, and if anyone wants to talk hockey, I can do that after this. <laughs> uh, and then in the top right, uh, I was also uh, uh, an initial attack forest fire ranger in, in for Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources, so for the, for the Ontario province. And that's the highest level of, uh, so I reached the highest level of fire, firefighting. So each one of these could have been my career, but it, of course it wasn't. Uh, I just, I sort of tried many things and, uh, and went back to my favorite high school subject, geography. Uh, and, uh, and I heard of a program starting up at Carleton University in Ottawa, at the time one of the first in North America, and it was called Geographic Information Processing. I, it interested me because it was geography and computers. And uh, that, that decision was very smart by me uh, in, in the mid-90s to focus on computers. And so I'm talking way too long about my history, but, but I did focus back then, even I started to take C classes and Java classes, uh, you know, when the rest of my peers in geography were taking electives in the arts, uh, I, I kind of went towards uh, computer science because I felt it just gives me more, more knowledge. Um, I'm glad I did that. So uh, um, as Jean-Philippe said, uh, I've been focusing for quite a long time on open source. I didn't even call it open source myself uh, back in the, the 90s. I, I, I wrote some papers and called it freeware. Remember that term we called freeware back in the 90s? Uh, so I, I was interested in the community around freeware at the time. 
And uh, 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 during my placement, uh, co-op placement at university, there was a new startup in Ottawa, uh, and there was three three people. Uh, one of them is Daniel was Daniel Morissette from Map Gears, uh, a consulting company here in this province, and that was the company at that time was DM Solutions Group. So I was the fourth person to join DM, DM Solutions Group in around mid uh, late late 90s, and we started looking at open source. So uh, just to give you a background on where I'm coming from, so here's Lunenburg, if anyone's not familiar with uh, the south shore of Nova Scotia. This is the nearest town, so when I go in to get groceries, it's only 2,000 people, so it's quite a small place. Um, and I took this photo, so this is a real thing. Um, but uh, this is actually my home office view. Spoiled, isn't it? Tough, tough place to work from. So, uh, uh, but as it says there, it's not that sunny often there. Uh, so that's, so Lunenburg is over here. This is the mouth of the harbor. So uh, if I was looking directly that way, it'd be France across the Atlantic. Uh, if anyone knows, Lunenburg is famous. I'm so talking so much about not, about what I'm supposed to be <laughs> talking about. But Lunenburg is famous for making the ship that's on the 10 cent coin, uh, the Blue Nose. And the Blue Nose comes out of Lunenburg and curls in front of my house, so I love it here. <laughs> I moved here about 10, 11 years ago from Ontario. My mother's from Cape Breton. Uh, so we do get snow, very, very little, but mostly it's fog. Anyway, so <laughs> why am I here? What, what do we mean by free and open? You know, uh, we have a lot of experts in this room. I saw some amazing presentations this morning. Uh, that's for sure, and uh, I'm not here to explain what is open source to the room, but it's important to realize that as we hear this term more and more, uh, that there is a true definition, and, and there is an accepted definition, and that is one that was put, put together by an initiative called the Open Source Initiative, and they have a definition of what open source is. And you can see there are some requirements, key requirements like freely distributed, the source code is shared, um, uh, no, you know, a license for every downloadable piece of code, uh, no discrimination, et cetera, et cetera. But this is kind of the core of the open source movement, this belief, this structure, these rules. Now, not everyone that's involved in open source agrees with every, all uh, 10 points, but this sort of captures captures the belief. And I'm not personally against someone who thinks it's okay to have one to five accepted and five to whatever not. That's okay. There are, you know, and that's part of what's, what's made, uh, I was about to say false for G, but uh, open source so popular is because it's sort of um, been open to all these changes and adapting. And when the industry is adapt, open source is adapt. So the beginning of GEO, um, there were several projects of in, in, involved in geospatial back in the 80s. And one of the big ones is GRASS-GIS. This is a raster base one. And that was initially developed by the US Army Corps of Engineers back in the 80s. Uh, I see a lot of nodding heads, that's great. I'm not surprised that there are a lot of GRASS people. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very technical project. It can be difficult to start. It has a big learning curve maybe but it's very powerful for raster analysis. I started, as I said, looking uh, uh, at, at open source and specifically map server um, around you know, early 2000s. The third point is kind of important because it's, it hits home to here in Canada, is that the Canadian, Canadians played a large part in, in expanding geo mapping and open source. There was a geo connections program back in the early 2000s and uh, of course, you know that GeoConnections is a program through Natural Resources Canada. And that kind of funded a lot of standards work in projects like MapServer. Um, and uh, looking back, I was part of, I was lucky to be with a company, a small company at the time, and we were, we were part of that. And it was great to be a part of, to help, to help expand open source that way. Um, and then a lot of, so you can see sort of the growth years were 2000 to 2010 in open source. 
this is, uh, I kind of grabbed this. I didn't create this slide, to be honest, but it's a nice view of, it's sort of uh, outdated in a sense. You don't see much here, but you can get a grasp of, and if you squinted, you could see that we kind of go way back to something called uh, the Map Overlay and Statistical System, MOSS, M-O-S-S. That's way back in 1980 or so. But if you looked closely, you could see things that you would recognize, like at the time we called it Quantum GIS, so QGIS, around you know early 2000s. Map server's in there. You can see, of course, its other name, UN Map Server, around uh, 1990s, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see a lot of growth here. Um, and then community, right? Um, I'm a big community guy. It seems everyone here is a big community person. This is a community in itself. Um, so I'm, I've always focused on the importance of community. And, and I just want to mention the standards community. So you, people would be familiar with the open OGC. Sorry, I use a lot of an acronym. But, uh, OGC, but it started as, not a lot of people are familiar with this, but it started as the Open Grass Foundation in 1990s. And then it sort of restructured into sort of a, so its grassroots was an open source foundation. And then it changed into the old Open GIS Consortium, and then renamed as OGC. And what I, when I say OGC to a lot of people, they think of industry, uh, you know, 520 some odd paying members. But don't forget that it started back with the, with the Free and Open Grass Foundation. And uh, so uh, we have no audio for this, but I did bring a video, but it's actually on YouTube. So in 1987, uh, the, the US Army um, wanted to promote grass, so they paid William Shatner uh, uh, to do a voiceover narrate for a grass video, Intro to Grass GIS. <laughs> it's phenomenal. It, you know, because it's 1980s, and uh, you see, uh, and he gives it, you know, and he's talking about loading a map, and you can see the kind of screen kind of thinking, trying to load the raster map, you know? <laughs> uh, so it's actually online, it's on YouTube, it's really special. You can, you can Google it. It's hilarious to hear his voice talk about grass. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, of course, the software community, that's all the part that I focus on personally. Um, uh, and uh, as, uh, as Jean-Philippe mentioned, I, I, my background is with, the, with Austrio, the Open Source Geospatial Foundation, which was founded in two, 2006, uh, February 2006. So you can see we've been around for over 10 years, 12, 13 years. It's a registered nonprofit, actually in the U.S., uh, because it was easy in Delaware, but it's an international foundation with international members, free membership, roughly 30,000 people, uh, really global, all um, volunteers, no employees, uh, and interesting, and you don't see this talked about lots in, in presentations, it started from Autodesk. Uh, this is a fact that I kind of now starting to go and give talks to make people realize that we do have a big connection to industry. Autodesk at the time had a had a, an open source mapping product called MapGuide. Well, they still do, right? Uh, and they wanted to quote. They didn't know what it meant, but open source it, right? So they came to uh, to a few people. Uh, um, and uh, a known leaders in the open source geo community and, and put together and help fund this registered nonprofit organization, this foundation. Uh, they actually provided 500,000 US dollars at the beginning as seed funding for Austria. Again, you can't see this anywhere. The history is sort of being forgotten. So that's why I'm here to sort of, to, to make everyone realize that there's a key point to and connection with industry and open source. That's one of the key things I want you to take away. Um, so, uh, I mean, this group seems to get it. <laughs> uh, I don't need to explain the powers uh, and benefits of open source geo, but the key ones are there that we know, right? Easily accessible. You can download it. You can install it. You can get a new version. It's constantly being uh, adapted. If there's a security issue, it's fixed that night. And then you can download the next day. 
as opposed to maybe the typical product cycle where it would be next uh, quarter or 2020. Uh, nothing against that, but uh, that this is the, sort of the key difference between an open source cycle and a, a normal product cycle. Uh, and then, you know, uh, standard support and now f and backed by foundation. So I have to kind of make sure I kind of move along here. Um, so because I want to get some key points, but uh, there's a key event that I actually at the time uh, begged my boss to attend. Uh, I'd heard of a, something called Phosphor G. It was about 2003. I talked to my boss and I went to Bangkok, not knowing what anything about it. But uh, this was a researcher, a Japan researcher from India, who coined the phrase and brought a bunch of us together, about 100 of us at the time. And that was the first Phosphor G event in Bangkok. Um, and that's what it stands for, the Free and Open Source soft Software for Geospatial Phosphor G. I'll explain the, the ribbon. And this, that first event, this was a five-year-old daughter of that fellow who coined the phrase. And she drew, you know, may the FOSS be with you. Very cute. And it uh, uh, was, was on the T-shirt, you know. It was actually written on the T-shirt. So it's a very cute story. I, I've become friends with her uh, since. And, yeah, that's, that's pretty neat. Uh, so that's where fos for g was born. Um, in the event in Bangkok, uh, uh, this is the fellow that coined uh, the term. Uh, this is the grass leader, uh, Marcus Nettler. Uh, uh, and myself, and we met in Bangkok for the first time ever, never met each other, knew of each other. Venka brought us together for uh, a private talk, and we said, let's create a global event. And uh, the rest is history. As somewhere on some Wikipedia says, page says, uh, I feel that it actually changed the industry. I really do. I feel that it's one of the best things that happened in my career, uh, and I'm very proud of helping to do that. When you have an idea, you have the or a movement or whatever we call this, you have you always have like the the person that coined it. Then you have the another person that plus ones it. Then you have the person that goes back in this case to Canada, me, uh, back to Ottawa at the time, and and kind of did things. Like someone had to create a process to move the global event around the world, create a committee, uh, you know, branding, uh, blah, blah, blah. So I'm very proud of that, that I helped uh, kind of promote Phosphor G all around the world. So that, that's a key. And then we, we, we got back together again in, in Phosphor G Europe in, in last, last year, two years ago. So very special. So there's a process to move this global event now all around the world to three different regions. And this is where I'll speed up a bit. And the, the ribbon is important. Uh, the ribbon is sort of, uh, I, I'll take credit for it, take credit for the pushing the ribbon. I got to give credit to the designer. It was him and I that sat down. This name is Fr Fred Warnock. Him and I worked together with Daniel Morissette at DM Solutions. So again, uh, credit to Danielle and DM Solutions, now Mapgears. Uh, and uh, that flow, as I call it, I've always said the ribbon for Foster G, is the, it symbolizes the flow of ideas and sharing. So think of workshops, uh, think of uh, talks, uh, lightning talks, uh, you know, think of showing up in whatever you want to wear. You can wear a suit, you can wear shorts, you can wear flip-flops. I mean, that's kind of, to me, the Foster G spirit is, is more about sharing, not about what you look like or what you drive or who you work for. So that, that's what I think Foster G is about. Um, and then I was involved in the first uh, sort of open source uh, get together back in 2004 in North America in Ottawa. So somewhere in here, there are several people from Quebec in here. Actually, I think Terry Bedard would be in here from Laval. Uh, Danielle would be in here, uh, many actually. So then just, just to give you a glim uh, glimpse of where it's kind of been, uh, some, uh, that's not a politically correct picture, but that's me on a beach. Someone said, uh, after a talk, someone said, oh, let's open up our laptop. I think we were on Bondi Beach, so that's a little embarrassing. <laughs> Coding on Bondi Beach. So, but it's brought, this has brought together the community from all around the world. Um, uh, I'm very proud to have 
actually uh, tried to go to so many phosphor G's, and not just global events, uh, these smaller events all around uh, the world. So you can actually, anyone can hold a phosphor G event. Anyone could use the ribbon. Uh, and that's one of the things I want to relay here. So you could actually have a, a phosphor G Quebec or a French phosphor G Geomont or uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's quite easy to do that. You don't even need to email me and say, can we use a ribbon or things like that? Or, you know, it's free marketing. You use the hashtag phosphor G. It's just great to share that way. Um, so it's just moved all around the world, including Sri Lanka. Uh, uh, Foster G Asia has an event every two years. Uh, not every year, they, they do it every two years. Um, Foster G Japan has three or four or five, they're growing. They have one in Osaka, Tokyo, uh, Hokkaido, et cetera, et cetera. India has one every two years. It's amazing what's this turned into. Europe has one every year, I think, now. Um, uh, that's Korea. They actually have, so this was a global event. So once a year, the global one moves around. But Phosphor G, uh, uh, Osteo Korea has their own Phosphor G event every year in, in Korea. And they get about 500 people. So it's amazing. So keep going on Belgium, <laughs> uh, you know, Europe again. Uh, but I want to just stop at Boston because this was last year. It feels like last year. Anyway, 2017. It goes fast, lots of events. You can see 1,161 people. So this is the last time it was in North America. It was in Boston, the global event, the global event. Uh, the, to get in, I'm not so proud of this, but it was about $1,000 US dollars for the ticket, which is crazy, I know. Uh, I'm not for that, but that's what it was. Uh, uh, and it, just take a look at the major sponsors. So these are platinum, you know, gold. This says everything, and, and you can take this away better than any talk from me. You can just look at, look who's there. IBM, Digital Globe, Google, uh, you know, Red Hat, ESRI, uh, Location Tech, which is a sort of a commercial business uh, foundation that was formed uh, about five, six, seven years ago. Planet, of course, which is now a superpower in open source geo companies. Planet out of Silicon Valley. Uh, some of you may know Frank Warmerdam from GDAL, who created GDAL. Sorry, everyone has a pronunciation. But he works for Planet now. Anyway, that says it all. That's where we are. And that's kind of where we're going. Um, so uh, it was recently, I think, I was here. It was in uh, Dar es Salaam in, uh, in September, October that last year, um, which was phenomenal. I think there was eight, 800 uh, attendees. It was a special event. Um, and then recently there was a Foster G Asia in, in Sri Lanka, which was also great. Uh, we also uh, give an award each year uh, to thank someone in the osteo slash Foster G community. You can see it's sort of an overlap. I use both terms. Uh, I was, uh, so I helped uh, found the award and I was quite pleased to be on the stage and award it to Astrid uh, from the MapBender community. MapBender is sort of another open source project, big in Germany and very big on standards. So I'm going to speed up a bit since we're about 20 after. Uh, Foster G today, well, uh, yesterday. Uh, anyway, I took the time to do this and I listed all of the Phosphor G events all around the world last year. It's phenomenal. Uh, I, I counted 20 plus uh, small events. So this doesn't even count the, uh, the Boston event or et cetera, et cetera. So where are we today? Where, where is open, free and open and open source today? So you can see that Major projects have been around, the core projects have been around for a while. Like I said, Grass, Map Server, PostGIS, um, Proj, uh, which is projection translation. Uh, and, and I believe that these projects continue to lead the way in, in innovation and in standards, adopting standards. Uh, the last point, my point is that uh, Virtually all proprietary products now leverage open source. That's just the reality of today. I'm going to give you an example of today of the QJS community. We'll see lots of talks, or are, we already heard lots of QJS talks and, and workshop this afternoon.
But uh, they actually get together. Uh, they're one of the strongest, I think, communities, active, supported, uh, QJS is. And they actually have their own user conference now. I was part of this. I was there. Uh, that was in Denmark um, out of Forestry campus, actually, a uh, beautiful campus in northern, northern Denmark. Uh, and, and again, sometimes it's important to look at the sponsor page when you look at these foundations. In, in this case, uh, I wanted to show you the sponsors of the QJS project. Again, because uh, we've, we're, we've come so far now, we're not in the base, someone's basement, you know, unpaid, no, not make any money. Instead, uh, all of these groups want to help fund the development of QJS. And at the top, you can see many user groups. Uh, there's many more. I just put a few, few logos there. Uh, Swiss group, Denmark, Brazil group is very active, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, these logos change all the time. So I'll keep going. Map server, I've, I'm just wanted to quickly mention because I'm with the Map server project. It's it. Um, and just quickly, I just wanted to talk about uh, Map server itself. Is that we're going through a Map server 7.4.0 release right now? If there are Map server people in here, I wanted to also take the time. To, the second point is a, a, a Quebec company out of Chicoutimi, Daniel Morris said, is now working with Natural Resources Canada to add map ML, so another term for everyone. Uh, map markup language, I think it is. And this is sort of being pushed by NRCAN and the CGDI, so that's a Canadian geospatial data infrastructure. And MapGears uh, uh, is very lucky to be working uh, on a funded project with NRCAN for that. So look for that, and that's happening. I was involved in uh, a lot of PHP 7 support. So I heard some P uh, PHP uh, talk recently in the previous talk. I, I'm heavily involved in PHP 7. And uh, with another hat on, uh, I actually uh, focus on Windows support for Map Server, and I have my own. Uh, installer called MS4W. It's ms4w.com. Believe it or not, it gets 4,000 installations a month. I think I am the largest Atlantic Canada software producer, and I'm one person. <laughs> of course, it's driven off much credit to Map Server, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but, but anyway, that's MS4W. Some amazing stats there. So I wanted to quickly mention we're coming near the end of time, but of course, getting to the good parts. Just get familiar with everyone. Uh, there was something called, they called, this is not my term, they called it raising the barn, where we have a lot of core projects like Proj, a Proj projection library that even ESRI leverages, and GDAL, et cetera, et cetera, post-GIS, and driven off of changes that need to uh, happen to all those projects. Um, they, call the, they put out a call for funding, uh, raise the barn, and all these different companies uh, stepped up and funded that work. That's actually still ongoing now. Um, so uh, you can pretty much see the who's who of the geo industry here. Cause, and that just shows you where the needs of open source are now. Anyway, so that, that little thing is important. So what about free and open? Reese, there, there, I have to go really fast now. So you can see there's a recent growth in the last five years of commercialization of open source. And this is important. You know, many people uh, maybe in misinterpret me. And again, this is why I'm here, so you can hear from me. I mean, I, how could I ever talk badly about commercialization when I am my own little mini company, right? So I get it. It's actually very important to have industry involved in open source. So in the last five years, um, those big companies or bigger companies getting involved is a very good thing. It brings brings a different demand to the community, uh, a product focus, you can say, and, uh, and professional support available uh, to the user uh, in training. So that's really key. In the last uh, December, there was a big announcement on Twitter where the federal government has, in one of their last directives, is recommending or encouraging you know, open source solutions. So uh, uh, preferred at the federal level. You probably can't read that, but the top one says, use open standards and solutions by default. Amazing. You know, uh, I retweeted that instantly. Uh, now, uh, 
whether this is a big deal or not is, you know, to me it is, it's part one. You know, someone from the UK replied in a tweet and said, well, we had that five years ago and, uh, you know, some negative things, but, you know, this is part one uh, or part two, you know, uh, and there's many steps, but this is a great movement. Uh, so we're actually Foster G. I consider it as an adolescent growing into an adult. You saw the fast growth happen in the 2000s. Uh, foundations have formed, events are happening, but as an adult, Foster G, op or open, or free and open, or open source, or o open source JS, whatever term, geomatics, whatever, we need more teaching at, the, at all levels in schools. And I, when I say all levels, I actually mean high school, I mean SAGEP, university, everything. Um, and more and more, we need to see it at the younger years. We're seeing it at the university level, but we're, we need to go earlier. Um, that's where the young, brilliant minds start, and, and we need to get them early. Uh, oh, sorry. Anyway, so uh, uh, more you obviously focus on the users. That's one of the downsides of, of, of open source. Sometimes we make it hard on users by not keeping documentation, installers up to date. Certification, that's a big deal actually in a lot of parts of the world, like getting a, a paper, you know, I'm certified to use Phosphor G uh, and use that, on my, uh, use that on my resume. This is big in places like, I've been to some countries in Africa that uh, you, you, you know, any, any conference you attend, you need a certification after to prove it. So, and the last point is important, and that's why I'm here, is as we mature, let's keep it fun. That's why I fell in love with it. I'm sure that's why a lot of you fell in love with it. Let's all keep the fun, you know, here. Um, and, and when things are changing, and, you know, uh, it's sometimes you lose focus on the fun. So get involved. Please get involved. I know you're already involved, but get more involved. Introduce yourself. That's Osteo. This is Geofrol, an education network. That's QGIS, that's Master, there are many, many more projects. Remember to, to share, to have fun, and to learn always, and, and that's it. And merci, thank you. Uh, and please um, email me or ask questions. If, you have, if I said something that's confusing or you don't understand what Osteo is, I probably had 60 slides on Osteo. But I thought it was important and timing-wise to go into more about Foster G and the community and, and things are happening. And, and in the end, it's about having fun and sharing. And I think we're all one family. And that's it. Thank you very much, everyone.